hello everybody welcome to the arena seminar um i'm here waving i don't know if you see me um i'm uh, hendrik schatz i'm the director of the arena network uh, this is the uh, last uh, seminar of the season so it's uh, time to acknowledge uh, and thank the organizing committee uh, which is entirely made up of early career researchers um, you can see them here uh, and I need to can you shrink the because I need to see the names I yep. I didn't memorize everybody <laughs> Okay, so organizing committee uh, for this season uh, were Umberto Battino from the University of Hull, Andreas Fleurs uh, from uh, EMI, uh, Aaron Good from MSU, James Keegans from Kiel, uh, Eliana Masha from uh, Dresden, uh, Tanji Mori from uh, Fukuoka in Japan, Sriteya Upadayula from Triumph and uh, Robert Yates uh, from uh, the UK. And you can see uh, each uh, of the organizers represents uh, one of the networks that uh, Arena networks together. And um, I think we really had an amazing program this year. Um, so I really want to thank you personally and, and also on behalf of the Arena community. Um, you guys did a great job. Um, can we have some applause or something? <laughs> You can press the, uh, the button thing. Anyways, <laughs> so um, thank you. Uh, I hope you had a good experience. Um, engaging early career researchers is a really important part of the network. Um, if you have any feedback on, on how we do that, if you have any new ideas, uh, I encourage you to, to uh, talk to me or Anna. We're happy to, to hear about that. And uh, there's also an opportunity, of course, if you're not on the committee and you're listening, to be on the committee. No, I think we have the committee for next we season. Have. We have that, but there is always a next season. So, and Anna, 2025 Anna's is taking, open. Anna's taking requests at any time. Um, and I think it's a great way. I hope it's a great way uh, for uh, early career researchers to also network a little bit together and get to know your international peers. So anyway, uh, with that, I'll uh, give it back to uh, Eliana uh, to kick off today's presentation. Thank you very much for the kind words, especially for me. I'm not talking uh, for all the committee, but for me, it was a great experience. And I am really happy. And I am more happy to and honored to uh, close this successful academic year with the seminar of Professor uh, Michel Hurst. May, uh, you can already share the slides, maybe. Um, Michel was born in 1975, and uh, uh, she studied uh, physics uh, in Hanover, where she also got her uh, PhD at the Institute for Gravitational Physics on gravitational waves in a new light. After the PhD, uh, she spent two years as a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. And then she uh, went in Australia for three years when she worked in the group of uh, Eleanor Huntington. In uh, 2010, she moved back in Hanover as a junior professorship on uh, fundamental noise sources in the laser interferometers. And from 2017, uh, she is professor of experimental physics at Leibniz University at Hanover, where she also received the teaching award. And now she works in the field of non-classical laser interferometry and quantum control. Of course, I cannot, and uh, I don't want to take so much time from Michelle, uh, but we, uh, it's better to leave the time for the talk. Uh, she is a long-term member and principal investigator of most of research related to gravitational waves and lasers, interferometers. And uh, she's also one of the proponents of the German Center for Astrophysics. So I will stop here and leave the floor to Michelle to give us some news from the universe. Uh, for all um, the people, uh, you might write your question in the chat, uh, or probably Michelle will ask you if you will have urgent questions during uh, the talk. Thanks a lot. And you have 40, 45 minutes. 
Thanks, Eliana, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone from the IRENA Network, for having me. I'm honored to be virtually present in your midst. Um, I should say in advance, I am an experimental quantum optician. So I work with laser light. That's my business. I'm a laser jock. I like playing with lasers. I like colors. Um, I know very little to nothing about nuclear astrophysics, but I'm very excited to learn about this. And I've been promised a tour of the Felsenkeller when I come to Dresden the next time. So very much looking forward to that. Um, I would love to take you on a little bit of a tour of, uh, well, maybe saying gravitational astrophysics is a bit too strong because I would like to show you how a gravitational wave detector works. If you don't already know that, um, that is fine. If you already know, maybe there will still be a couple of things that you didn't know in detail. Keep in mind, I'm an experimentalist, okay? So um, yeah, let's, without further ado, just jump right in. Uh, oh, <laughs> that was good. Um, so I, I know that all of you have witnessed the fact that um, we have been able to detect gravitational waves. It was hard to miss. And the first event that we that we detected directly was this kind of an event. This was uh, this is the, the visualization, not a simulation, just a visualization of the merger of two black holes. And what you can see over here are the indicated are the Schwarzschild radii of these two black holes. And now they turned into one. And the event is a very uh, strong astrophysical event. I'm just going to replay that. Um, however, the resulting strength of the wave, the amplitude of the wave that we can measure when it reaches us, these ripples in space-time, the periodic stretching and compressing of space-time that these kind of cataclysmic events produce, this strength is on the on the range of 10 to the minus 21 when it reaches us on the ground, and we can then detect it with gravitational wave detectors. And one thing that I really find very fascinating about um, gravitational waves in general is that even though these are strong astrophysical events that we need to have to produce measurable gravitational waves, um, black holes, for instance, are really, really simple um, objects, right? They have mass, they potentially have spin, and they potentially have charge. And so if two black holes merge, all the information encoded in that merging is in the gravitational waves and in the multi-messenger observations um, that we can sometimes detect afterwards. And the new black hole is really quite another boring creature. And so I, I like, for me, I, I think in images and the, 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 I liken it to a wet dog that shakes off all the excess information or water. And the new black hole is just a new black hole and you can't tell that it used to be two black holes. So this is the type of event that we've now detected a bunch of times, quite a few times now. And we have also detected a different type of um, event and that is the merger of two neutron stars. And these are these white golf ball looking things that are circling each other, also just a visualization. And the gravitational waves indicated in these white bluish um, waves are um, show the gravitational radiation being radiated out, radiated out. And then in this multi-messenger event, um, all the electromagnetic radiation that we were able to detect in unison with our friends from the electromagnetic community. And that happened over the course of many weeks, and there were 70 uh, observ observatories around the world and in space uh, watching this event as it happened and as it glowed out. And this was um, this this event had the name. I should probably yeah, this event had uh, the name uh, G or has the name GW seventeen o eight seventeen. And this is the first and only true multi messenger event of this kind that we have been able to detect, where we measured gravitational waves and then in the aftermath all this electromagnetic radiation all the way from the gamma ray burst um, via the ultraviolet to the infrared and then um, X rays. In the meantime, we've also been able to observe, and this is obviously just an artist's impression, of a black hole swallowing a neutron star. And the thing that really fascinates me about this, and I talked to my theory friends and colleagues about this, is that it seems like the two events we did measure in 2020, the black hole basically swallowed the neutron star whole, which to me as, an op as a quantum optician is, okay, maybe they just do that. But I think our theory friends were expecting that maybe, and it seems pretty likely, the neutron star should have been torn in, in, into pieces, should have been sort of sheared apart and, and sucked up. But it was basically gulped down in whole. At least that's what my theory friends tell me. So these are not singular events, meaning we, only, we haven't only measured one. We have now, in the meantime, in the past three observation runs of our gravitational wave detector network, which I will talk about a bit more, have measured and published 90 events. 
So what you see over here are masses in the stellar graveyard. So uh, visualization of star corpses and the blue um, circles indicate or blue dots indicate um, black holes. The bigger the dot, the more massive the black hole and uh, also encoded here on the Y axis. And the orange are neutron stars and the ones where you don't quite know if it's orange or blue, we don't quite know if it's a neutron star or a black hole. And if we just pick one by chance, just maybe this event, two black holes of masses just below and above 10 um, solar masses uh, ended up forming a black hole with 20 solar masses. And this is a chronological um, axis. So this was not evenly spaced. This is just a visualization because there were three observation runs. And then between each observation run, these gravitational wave detectors go into uh, an upgrade phase where everything is powered down and then upgraded, repaired, fired up again, uh, and then taken into uh, operation and then recommissioned because um, making upgrades to such a complicated device like a gravitational wave detector requires that you get to know your instrument again and, recomm and commission it. So it, you can basically calibrate your, your um, detector. So we've measured many events, 90 to date, in, published in the gravitational wave transient catalog number three. And soon we will go into the fourth observation run. It will start at the end of May. Currently we're in an engineering run, which just started on Wednesday. And we're very excited because this will take, this observation run will go for, will run for 20 months. And we hope to measure many, with our increased in sensitivity, we hope to measure and expect to measure a lot more events of this kind and maybe of different kinds. And the fascinating thing is measuring gravitational waves directly was never about, about prove, never just about proving Einstein right. Because um, we kind of already knew Einstein was right because Halson Taylor gave us these wonderful observations of the, um, um, of the pulsar system with um, a, an indirect measurement of gravitational waves. And so we obviously showed that Einstein was right. And um, sorry, I have the wrong slide over here. Never mind. Um, but we also measured a lot of other things, which I will show you in a, in a later slide. So just to remind you, because you might not be gravitational wave physicists, that gravitational waves um, occur across a very, very wide spectrum of frequencies. And the ones that we will be looking at today and the type of detection that we're looking at is the interferometric detection of gravitational waves, in particular with terrestrial interferometers, because that's all we have right now. Space interferometers will hopefully come in the mid thirties, we'll have the laser interferometer space antenna, LISA. And with this, we have, been able to measure binary black hole mergers, binary neutron star mergers, and black holes eating neutron stars. There are other ways of detecting gravitational waves, at least um, we expect that to happen. And one of them would be pulsar timing. So with pulsar timing arrays, which I will not talk about. And you should also see the cosmic microwave background polarization, um, but we also haven't measured that yet. And that's also a completely different kind of measuring uh, type of measurement to detect gravitational waves. And all of these open, a vast window into the universe, so to speak, because we would be able to de detect all sorts of different sources that produce gravitational waves, at least according to theory. So um, how do we do this? We do this with a worldwide gravitational wave detector network. And currently we are in the second generation of gravitational wave detectors, where all the orange and sorry, yellow um, names indicate operational gravitational wave detectors. And the green is a detector which is being constructed called LIGO India. The yellow ones are the two uh, US American advanced LIGO detectors in Hanford, which is in Washington state and in Livingston, which is in Louisiana. And these two uh, interferometers have an arm length of four kilometers. The Virgo detector, which is a French Italian collaboration located near Pisa in Italy, which is a three kilometer arm length uh, gravitational wave detector. Geo 600, which has 600 meter long arms, which are folded, so an effective arm length of 1,200 meters uh, in the vicinity of Hannover. And we uh, like this British-German collaboration very much because it's a think tank and has produced a lot of technology that now lives in the larger scale detectors. Plus our um, uh, the Japanese detector, Kagra, with our Japanese friends, um, which is a three kilometer length detector located um, in the Kamioka mine, which some of you might know for other reasons. Um, and it is also three kilometer um, detector. However, it is kind of a not second, but second and a half generation detector because it employs a lot of very advanced technology such as uh, cryogenic cooling and it's also underground. 
So um, all of these detectors together form this network, this current network of detectors, and they all look a little similar because they are all at their very core Michelson interferometers. So you can see over here, especially in this picture, I mean, this aerial view, these L-shaped um, configurations for Kagra underground and for all the others on the ground or slightly sunken into the ground. And when we detected the multi-messenger event GW1708-17, we worked together with our friends from the electromagnetic community um, and saw with electromagnetic follow-up with, um, uh, with 70 different observatories, amongst them Fermi and Integral, indicated over here, um, something that gave us so much information about um, our universe that we'd never been able to um, access before, which for you as members of the network of um, nuclear astrophysics is um, basically, we call it, do we call it carrying owls to Athens? I think that's what we say, right? You know more about this than I do. So what have we already learned? Um, we obviously had the first detection of gravitational wave from a binary black hole system. The event, this first event was called GW 1509514. -14. And if you're wondering about the naming convention, it's just the date. It's a gravitational wave event with the date in American writing. So we learned about physics of black holes. We have detection of gravitational waves from binary neutron star systems, not just one, but this one particularly as a multi-messenger event. Unfortunately, our friends from the neutrino detectors have not measured in unison, but you know, I kind of hope that might still happen, uh, which was able to then constrain the multi-messenger event, the equations of state of neutron stars. We're able to, with our detector network, localize quite well from where the source, um, where the source is located in the sky. We've verified the measurement of gravitational wave propagation speed, which is the speed of light. Again, tested general relativity, one more tick on Albert Einstein's list. Um, had the alternative measurement of, a, of the Hubble constant with the standard sirens. Um, we're able to see gravitational wave polarizations, both plus and cross, and have seen that there exist intermediate mass black holes in the mass gap where they were not expected. So this is already, I think, a pretty impressive astrophysical collection of successes, but we're far from done. Obviously, we want to do more statistically significant astrophysics with even more events. And for more events, this is a bit of a spoiler alert. If you want to do good astrophysics, you need to do many observations. And so for us as gravitational wave detection people, we need to see more gravitational or listen to more gravitational wave events. And that means being more sensitive and making our detectors more quiet. It's always about signal to noise ratio. One truism that I've learned over the course of my being a scientist. So what does a gravitational wave detector look like? At its heart, it is a simple, humble Michelson interferometer. And we remember that we require a light source, which in our case is a laser system because we have beautiful lasers. There is a beam splitter, a half transparent, half reflective mirror, it should ideally be 50-50 in its splitting ratio. And we have end mirrors over here indicated as these hmm, um, rectangles, which are supposed to be mirrors. And so these are the basic building blocks of any Michelson interferometer. And you can see there are quite a few other things inserted over here. And that is to increase the sensitivity of a Michelson interferometer beyond that which a bare Michelson would have. And for that, we employ quite a few sophisticated techniques. Let me mention a few, but only tell you about um, some in a little bit of detail, okay? One thing I could spend a lot of time on because I used to work on it myself is the laser system. It doesn't suffice to buy a laser system off the shelf. We need a very high power, but also at the same time, very precisely stabilized laser system. It has to be incredibly well stabilized in its power, in its output frequency or wavelength or phase, whatever you want to say, and in its spatial mode, in its geometric mode. And we require nominally 200 watts of laser light at 1064 nanometers, which is very near infrared, near infrared, in the Gaussian fundamental mode, the TM00 mode, which is wonderfully uh, round if you look at it um, face on. And it's not allowed to fluctuate in basically any of its, um, its ob observables. And that's not easy to make, it's not possible to buy, and so we make that. 
Um, another thing that we have to employ are so-called advanced interferometer topologies. So we employ something called power recycling and signal recycling. And if you're interested in this, make a note and tell me afterwards, and we'll go back to the slide and I'll explain what it is exactly. But beyond that, I'll just say we use some fancy techniques to make our interferometers more sensitive by using the light more innovatively. Recycling, it's all, it's all the rage, right? Sustainability. And in this case, this has been going on since the late 80s and was developed within the geo collaboration. I've highlighted all these um, optics over here in, in pale green because I want to indicate that all of these optics um, have to be, have to fulfill um, requirements regarding their thermal noise, which is another, my former boss used to say another kettle of bananas. Uh, so a completely different story, which I will not talk about in detail because thermal noise is a multi-headed beast. And we could talk about that for a long time. But very important about this is that all these mirrors are suspended. And I will talk about that in a little bit more detail in probably about two minutes. Oh, I actually, I didn't, well, I used the wrong picture. I'm so sorry. One thing I would love to talk about, but I will probably not have enough time. Don't ask me why this animation swallowed my last um little bit is the thing that I actually work on myself, which is squeezed light. We insert non-classical states of light into the output of this interferometer from here from the Faraday isolator into the output of the interferometer in order to increase the, um, or to, um, to improve the quantum noise um, uh, behavior of the interferometer. I'm sorry, I sh I'm showing you a broken slide. I don't know what happened. So where are we now? I'm showing you some pictures of um, uh, mostly Geo 600 pictures, some very old pictures over here of the suspended uh, vacuum tubes, um, and here the laser system in advanced LIGO. So where are we now? I'll show you what we're doing in the second generation of gravitational wave detectors in order to get our sensitivity up and our noise down. This is a design sensitivity curve, a noise budget calculated of uh, advanced LIGO. I say it is a noise budget because you can use different parameters and then your curves will shift around. I've chosen this one because I think it's nice and intuitive and it um, shows you all these uncorrelated noise sources with the legend over here. And as it is with uncorrelated noise sources, uncorrelated noise as, adds as the root of the sum of the square of all the individual noise constituents, which means the highest lying noise curve is always the biggest bad guy or gal, however you want to see it. So what are the highest line curves? They're this pink curve and this red curve over here. And the pink curve is quantum fluctuations. So it is quantum noise. Oh, damn it. It's quantum noise. And the red curve over here is um, coating Brownian noise of our mirrors. So you can see over here where these two, the pink and the red, are of the same um, size that the envelope, the sum of all the noises over here, this black curve, is a root two larger than both of them. And all the other noise curves are mostly not limiting over the wide part of the sensitivity of the gravitational wave detector. And sometimes we, we refer to this noise curve or the sensitivity as the bucket, because it's like this, right? It looks like a bucket and we can collect all our gravitational wave signals within that bucket, because any kind of signal has to be has to lie higher in this strain sensitivity, and you recognize the 10 to the minus 21 from earlier here, any signal that is larger than this black noise curve should be visible or audible, I should say. But if we look at this noise curve a little more closely, we can see at low frequencies, it's not really the pink curve that's limiting us. And at high frequencies, it's the pink curve. And in the middle, it's, you know, it's this red and the pink. So let's look at some of these areas a little more closely. If we look at the low frequency over here, you can see here's this brown curve, and then there's this green curve. Brown is seismic vibrations or seismic noise, and the green is Newtonian gravity. I would like to sum this up by saying this is the effect of mass or mass changes on our gravitational wave detector. And what can we do about that? So, mm, sorry, going back to this, just picture this, if you went back to your mm, beginner's lab in university and you built a Michelson interferometer, if you put your mirrors on a breadboard or an optical table and you walk around that optical table, your mirrors will shake. And if you look at the interference pattern, your interference pattern will shake. Obviously that's not gonna be good enough 
to detect gravitational waves. You somehow have to decouple the optics that you use as test masses for your gravitational wave signal. You have to somehow decouple them from the acoustic noise around you. You can put them in vacuum, or you can just build a box around it. Better put them in vacuum. On, and you have to somehow decouple your mirrors from the seismic noise. And how do you do that? Well, the best way to do that is to hang your mirrors as pendula. Now, I know I'm asking a lot, but um, who wants to see an experiment? Nobody wants to see an experiment. I'm disappointed. You get an experiment anyway. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ileana. Okay, you get an experiment because I like doing this experiment. If you have a mass, if you can see this, this is my charger. If you have a mass and it's standing on the ground or sitting on the ground, screwed to the ground and the ground moves, then obviously the mirror will move and that will, imp will impact the light source. The light will be phase modulated or have phase noise on it. And that's no good for a gravitational wave detector. If, however, I suspend my mass as a pendulum, and now this is my, my suspension arm sitting on the ground and I move my, my suspension point, which is my hand around, then below the resonance frequency, the mirror moves just, the mirror mass moves just like my suspension point. On resonance, that's a really bad idea because my, my mirror is gonna shake a lot. However, above resonance frequency, I have the beautiful transfer function of, an, of, a, of a harmonic oscillator. And basically this is moving, this suspension point is moving a lot, but the center of mass of my suspended mirror, the charger, is not basically not moving at all. Anything you're seeing is me being a really, really bad harmonic oscillator. So what we do is we hang our mirrors as pendula and thereby decouple from the seismic noise of the ground. And we don't just hang one mirror as one pendulum. We hang most of our mirrors, anything that's sensitive, as multiple pendula. So a pendulum from a pendulum from a pendulum. And the bottom stage over here, I hope you can see my cursor, is the mirror. And now you, can, might, you might ask yourself, why does the mirror look like a big chunk of glass? The reason is it's, it is glass. It's a fused silica. This is, these are about 10 kilograms because Geo 600 has smaller masses and uh, they are transparent looking because for visible light, they're transparent. For infrared, trust me, they're highly reflecting. They're beautifully highly reflecting. So we hang our mirrors as triple or even quadruple pendulum suspension. This is a, uh, an advanced LIGO suspension, a quadruple pendulum, where the masses have 40 kilograms and they're much bigger. And so you decouple for each pendulum stage because the transfer function of a harmonic oscillator is flat resonance and then falls as one on F squared. For every stage, you get the one on F squared. So you get for a quadruple pendulum, one on F to the power of eight isolation against noise. And now, if you recall, that brown curve dropped really steeply. And that's the one on F to the power of eight drop that you see. So above the pendulum resonance frequency, our mirrors are basically free falling in space. And how neat is that? Well, I personally think it's very neat. And I wanted to show you a couple more fancy bits about these suspensions. You have to, you can't just hang them from wires because wires have a lot of thermal noise. You have to hang our glass masses from glass fibers. Now you might ask yourself, why would you use glass fibers? That sounds very brittle and it sounds very breakable. And the interesting thing about glass fibers is they are very breakable. If you have the glass fiber like this and you ping it from the side, it will shatter. However, if you stretch a fiber, A, it stretches considerably. Secondly, it is incredible, it has incredibly high tensile strength. And the good thing is if you stretch them a lot, if you put them, if you um, stress them to um, a sizable fraction of their breaking strain, they actually show what is called dilution and thermal noise actually goes down. So there is a whole science of thermal noise mitigation or reduction um, hidden in, in this wonderful, complicated, but beautiful mechanical slash optical suspension because these fibers, these glass fibers obviously have to be welded to our glass masses. And this glass mass, we have a, a chain with the actual mirror, and then we have a reaction um, chain from which the um, actuation can happen because if you want to push something, you always have to push against something. That's what Newton said, right? Aktion gleich Reaktion. So I'm just trying to show you that these suspensions are wonderfully um, 
complicated, but only as complicated as necessary. And that's how we decouple from seismic. Now, you could ask yourself, isn't the quadruple suspension already um, quite complicated? It is. However, if you need to go even better in seismic isolation, you can build more stages. And our friends with, from the Virgo collaboration actually have so-called super attenuators with seven stage pendula. So you can build them higher, but that has its own mm, challenges attached uh, because the first stage is actually an inverted pendulum. You can imagine that the tilting is really quite challenging to control. Or you could go for nested geometries, which are Japanese colleagues are doing, where you can basically go um, inverted pendulum, uh, normal pendulum, inverted pendulum, normal pendulum, which is indicated over here, which saves you height in build, but adds complexity in control. But you might also have to go cryogenic, which is also being done in the Japanese detector. So this is um, an incredibly exciting, highly dynamical um, area of research in the gravitational wave community. So that was suspensions and thermal noise, um, sorry, seismic noise and a little bit of thermal noise. And now let's move on to something else that is required. And I already mentioned that we need to have the best laser systems in the world. And I'm proud to say that they actually come from Hannover. So that's really cool. Um, uh, which are used in the gravitational wave, detec wave detectors around the world. Um, and you see over here that these are obviously not off the shelf. These are custom made laser systems. They're master oscillator power amplifier systems where you have um, so these people over here, uh, at least some of them are my colleagues from Hannover, but I can't tell you who they are because they're wearing clean room clothes or so-called bunny suits. Um, but the, this was, I think, during installation of the system in one of the advanced LIGO detectors. Oh no, I'm sorry, I, I forgot a slide. What I wanted to say is that these systems are, are as complicated as you would like them, and they consist of a two-stage so a three-stage master oscillator power amplifier system. And obviously the entire system fills a large optical table. These are average sized people, so you can see how large this entire setup is. And once you've built the stabilized laser system, the so-called pre-stabilized laser system, then that light is coupled into the interferometer proper and then actually stabilized to the interferometer. So we have these wonderful um, um, suspended so-called optical mode cleaners, which are optical resonators made up out of suspended mirrors, just like I showed you earlier. And you can use these as frequency references because they've got basically freely falling test masses in space time that give you a wonderful quiet reference. So maybe one question that you might ask yourself is um, if, if Michelle claims that these laser systems are as good as they, um, as she claims they are, why was quantum noise relevant in gravitational wave detectors, that pink curve I showed you? And what is quantum noise even in the context of laser interferometry? Now, I always like to use this um, abstract uh, for mm, to exemplify mm, how one writes an abstract when one is really confident and also really good in what one does. This is a colleague, Carton Caves, who is still active. And in the 80s, he wrote a bunch of seminal papers, one of them being this one, quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations in an interferometer. Now, this is 1980. We don't have any uh, gravitational wave detectors yet. Um, and squeezed light has not yet been demonstrated. And Carton Caves writes this beautiful abstract. It, the interferometer is now being developed to detect gravitational waves work by measuring small changes in the positions of free masses. We know these free masses are these suspended mirrors. There has been a controversy whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations disturb this measurement. This letter sol resolves the controversy. They do. <laughs> now, I would like to be as confident as Carlton Caves and write an abstract like that someday, and it's not going to happen. However, he was right. And I will show you in a scant few minutes why he was not, how he was right and why he was right. Let's revisit this design sensitivity curve. So I said I would talk about the brown and I would talk about the green. I didn't talk, uh, well, I talked about laser noise, but you don't even see laser noise over here because laser noise is a non-issue. Our colleagues have stabilized that away. Now we're gonna look at quantum noise, which is this pink curve. And you might ask yourself, why does quantum noise in a gravitational wave detector look so weird? Why does it have obviously at least two regimes, this, this drop with one on F squared, and then this flat area over here, which then bends up at high frequencies. 
and I'll try to motivate why that is the case. It is because quantum mechanics is, um, because it's quantum mechanics. Quantum noise in an interferometer manifests in two distinct and uncorrelated ways. The light that comes out of a well-behaved laser and could be described as a coherent state or a Glaube state is um, subject to the quantum mechanical fluctuations of this laser field. And that comes from the, stems from the Poissonian photon statistics or is manifested in the Poissonian photon statistics of the laser, which I have indicated over here by the inherent graininess in this laser beam. You're not supposed to draw photons as balls, but I'm going to, for the sake of the argument, write, write that, and, and that part is true, that the arrival time of the photons at a detector is Poisson distributed. And you're not surprised by that, I'm assuming, because you're familiar with these things. And so is um, radioactive decay, right? And so laser light has shows a Poissonian distribution, and you have this so-called detection noise, which um, is also called shot noise. And when we divide the shot noise, which is proportional to the number of photons, um, the number of total, the root of the number of total photons, we divide it by the total laser power, then this relative shot noise over here scales with one on root of the laser power. And because it's a Poissonian statistic, you're not surprised by that, at least I hope you're not. This is one way that quantum mechanics manifests in a laser interferometer. There is a distinctly different way that it manifests, but caused by the same effect. And that's quantum radiation pressure noise. The same laser light, when it hits a suspended mirror, and you know why we suspend now, blows away that mirror by, more or by a more or lesser degree. And that obviously scales with the root of the power, because the more power I have, the more my mirror is blown away, the less power I have, the less the mirror is blown away. And we're not talking about the static displacement, we're talking about fluctuations. These fluctuations are born from the quantum mechanical nature of the light. And they scale, in this case, as root of the power. They also scale as one on the Fourier frequency squared. And that was the one on F squared drop that you saw in the quantum noise. And another thing that happens is obviously the heavier, heavier the mirror is, the less the mirror can be affected by the strength of the laser field. Now, that's not the whole story. The whole story comes now. And that is your... Um, laser light blows away the mirror by varying degrees. But in the next instance of time, the mirror will fall back into its position of equilibrium, or if it were a cantilever, it would push back due to the restoring force of Hooke's law. And your mirror pushes back on the light field and thereby so-called amplitude quadrature fluctuations on the light that cause the mirror to move away more or less are translated by this optomechanical interaction of the light being pushed back by the mirror moving, which translates those fluctuations into the phase quadrature of the light, because the wave is being pushed by the mirror. Does that make sense? I do hope it makes sense because I can't see your faces, but this is a really, really fundamental thing, which is why this stuff is called back action noise. The light pushes the mirror, the mirror pushes the light back. So you have on the one hand detection noise, which is relative shot noise, and it scales with one on root of the power. You have, on the other hand, quantum radiation pressure noise, which is back action noise, where the light um, pushes the mirror and the mirror pushes back on the light. And these two scale conversely with power. Which means, just by turning the power up or down of my laser, which I can do, does not help you in both regimes. If I turn the laser power down, my quantum radiation pressure noise in the low frequency range goes down, but in the high frequency range it actually goes up and vice versa. And the intersection point of these two branches is the minimal point where the, where the sum of these two is minimal. And this intersection point is called, well, the, the um, ensemble of all the intersection points run on this line, which is called the standard quantum limit of interferometry. So you see over here, these two graphs are moving up and down conversely, and the intersection point runs on this graph called SQL, standard quantum limit of interferometry, which falls as one on F. And going below that standard quantum limit is actually non-trivial. And you have to use some tricks. So I'm going to take a quick breath because I have already used up more than half an hour of my time. And we will see how far we can go with this. I would like to show you that we have been using so-called squeezed light 
routinely in the gravitational wave detector GO600 for more than, well, now it's been 13 years. And that's quite a long time because um, actually squeeze light was postulated in 1975 or 76, and it was for the first time shown in 1985. And those were like 0.2 or 0.3 dB of squeezing. Nowadays, we have more than 10 dB of squeezing. We put those 10 dB into the gravitational wave detector. The actual squeezing bench is this highlighted area over here. And these are average sized German, I think all men. So this guy is about a meter 90. So you can see this bench is quite large. It contains three laser systems, about 200 optical components, many, many nested control loops in order to produce squeeze light. And it looks schematically like this. Here's the squeezing bench. Here you recognize our interferometer, your light source, your laser system, the beam splitter, and the end mirrors, with, in this case, the folded arms. And here's your output detector where you detect the interferometry, the interferometric signal. And as I mentioned earlier, our gravitational wave detector has this bucket-shaped sensitivity. Now you see this is a real sensitivity, not a calculated noise curve. This is an actual noise curve. And because GO600 has some issues with, um, with a couple of noise sources, it's not a clean curve over here, but you can see the envelope of this blue, this blue is the actual detector noise if you don't use squeeze light. And if you do use squeeze light, you reduce your noise, that is increase your sensitivity from the blue curve to the red curve. Because lower noise means you can see more signals above that. So signal to noise ratio is improved. And we recently were able in GO600 to show 6 dB of fixed quadrature squeezed light in GO600. In advanced Virgo, which is the French Italian detector, they also use squeezing, which actually coincidentally also comes from Hannover. The American advanced LIGO detectors actually employ a squeezed light source that was developed between uh, the team at MIT and uh, an Australian uh, group from the Australian National University. And they use a different type of squeezer, an in vacuum squeezer, but they're all using squeezing now. And I'm going to use the example of advanced Virgo to show you that they also go from their black sensitivity curve at high frequencies with out squeezing to the red sensitivity, which is better lower noise, if they use the correct kind of squeezing. If they use the incorrect or not correctly tuned kind of squeezing, in this case, phase quadrature squeezing is good, amplitude quadrature squeezing would be bad, then your noise increases, which would not be a good choice. Now we know from the curve that I showed you earlier that one goes up and the other goes down. If the red curve relative to the black shows an increase in sensitivity here, do we see a decrease in sensitivity at low frequencies and vice versa? If the blue causes a decrease in sensitivity at high frequencies, do we see an increase at low? Well, this curve is inconclusive, but if we have a closer look then and do some better, more careful analysis, then you can see now normalized to the noise without squeezing, which is the zero, um, which is the, um, zero line over here. If you use the correct kind of squeezing for high frequencies, you actually see an increase in noise at low frequencies. So zoomed in over here is this inset. And it means that phase quadrature squeezing, which is the good kind of squeezing for high frequencies, reduces as designed relative shot noise. However, quantum radiation pressure noise here at low frequencies is increased. The two flip sides of this quantum mechanical coin cannot be tricked. I have not told you what squeezing is. I have not told you how it's produced. That would be a story for a different for a different seminar. If you're interested, let me know. You can wake me up at midnight and I will tell you about squeezing any day. But the thing is that what we can see over here, we're tuning the quantum mechanical properties of our light carefully to get an increase in sensitivity at one frequency range. It comes at a cost. And that cost is an increase in noise, a decrease in sensitivity at low frequencies. And what that means, and now you please follow me on this, this mm, I always liken it, it's, it's kind of a beautiful, terrifying, but beautiful result. We're manipulating the photon statistics of a vacuum state. We're basically carefully pushing around photons in our photon statistics. And this causes the 42 kilogram mirrors of the advanced Virgo detector, big chunks of glass, macroscopic mechanical objects suspended as pendula to move in excess. We're causing extra quantum radiation pressure noise, which we can measure. Isn't that amazing? 
I think it's, well, maybe that's just the sick quantum optician in me, but I find it beautiful and terrifying that we can see macroscopic quantum mechanics. And so this is one result that I really wanted to show you, and I hope you like it as well. Maybe it takes a bit of thinking about it, but what we're really seeing is 42 kilogram mirrors being moved in excess by a manipulation of the quantum noise of the light, which is a, a, a whiff of nothing, really photons being pushed around. So I would like to show you where, where we're going from here, because trust me, this is really not the end of the road. Um, we're going to the next generation of gravitational wave detectors, and I am running out of time, so I'll up the ante a little bit. And let me reassure you, don't worry, we're going to be using what is called frequency dependent squeezing, and we're going to be using it as of next month. So then you will get an increase in sensitivity, both at high and low frequencies. It's infinitely more complicated to produce, but I have really clever colleagues that have been able to do it. And it's the most impressive result that I have seen in a long time. So this is an image of where we want to go. Just some pretty pictures. I told you I like colors, right? Let me tell you a little bit about where you want to go. We want to go to the next generation. You'll excuse me, I'm a Trekkie and a nerd. And um, I'm going to take you to the next generation, the worldwide detector network of the future. So we will have more detectors on the ground, Cosmic Explorer in the US, the Einstein telescope in Europe somewhere, and hopefully a detector in Australia, potentially called NEMO or Cosmic Explorer South, whatever they want to call it, fingers crossed, and the laser interferometer space antenna, at least one space-borne detector in space. And I would like to focus a little bit on the Einstein telescope because I'm a European and I uh, would like to talk about the European detector. So 3G, third generation detectors, relative to second generation detectors, measured and calculated, slightly older graph here, will give us an increase in sensitivity of a factor of 10 or even more at low frequencies. That's the particular strength of the Einstein telescope. It will be very sensitive at low frequencies. Now, you might ask yourself what a sensitivity increase of a factor of 10 is. That doesn't sound like a huge amount. But if you have a sensitivity increase in amplitude of a factor of 10, then you can observe 10 times wide. Well, I probably don't have to tell you because you're doing nuclear astrophysics. 10 times further in X, Y, and Z direction gives you a, gives you a thousand times large, larger observable volume. And that means we can detect a thousand times more events. And this will result in an astrophysical reach um, increased by this much in redshift, respectively to the second generation detectors for Cosmic Explorer in pink and, Cos and Einstein Telescope in green. And you can see, especially for the high mass events um, at, which occur at low frequencies, where the Einstein Telescope has its strength, uh, we will get a much larger um, view into the past, so to speak. What will the Einstein Telescope look like? It will be an observatory located entirely underground. It's a European project. I'm very excited about that. It will be a triangular un observatory underground at two to 300 meters depth with three kilometers arm length. And you can see here, red, blue, and green are the three detectors made up of two interferometers each, one high frequency, one low frequency. Here's the artist impression from 2011, which has evolved into the artist impression of 2020. A little bit more better graphics. And um, what it will be is um, expensive, <laughs> but it will also give us a lifetime of 50 years plus, we hope, and will create obviously a socioeconomic impact, which we're looking forward to. It's also a, a challenge to coordinate such a large European consortium, but it's been very fun getting into this. I'm quite involved in this these days and I, I'm having a good time learning about what everybody else in Europe can do to make this work. The location is completely undecided as of now. There are two candidate sites, one in the, in the um, triangle between the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, one on Sardinia and a potential um, site in Lusatia. Uh, so about an hour's drive from Dresden. And um, I will talk about that a little bit more. It's a potential site. It's not a candidate site yet. And we're still doing investigations whether we should put our ring, our name in the, in the hat, throw our names in the ring, so to speak, and um, make this a candidate site. And then obviously science and maybe politics will have to decide. And I would like to talk for maybe two minutes about the German Center for Astrophysics. Eliana was kind to mention it. This was uh, founded in or funded in, uh, in, well, in the end of September last year, 2022. 
It's the German Center for Astrophysics. This is the original slide, a center for research technology and digitalization. And uh, we are built on, I, I've kept these in German on purpose because these are the original defense slides, so to speak. Uh, the three um, challenges today or the large challenges today um, are astronomy with the square kilometer array and, um, and gravitational wave astronomy, but also more is astronomy technology development for uh, future astrophysical or astro astronomical experiments and um, to have development for industry and digitalization. Um, keywords here would be uh, green computing. And it will be located in Lusatia, which is part of Saxony. And there will be two sites. One site will be in Görlitz, where the campus will be, which is very close to the Polish border. And the other site will be in this triangle between Hoyerswerda, Kamenz and Bautzen, where we will locate our underground lab. It's called Low Seismic Lab because we um, have had done some preliminary investigations and the granite, in the granodiorite in Lusatia seems to be a 20 kilometer slab, diameter slab of granite, which goes after about 70 to 100 meters of uncompacted um, rubble and rock. It seems to be a basically monolithic slab of granodiorite, 20 kilometers diameter and 10 kilometers thick. And we could drill the most amazing cavern into this, which could, it's not going to look like this because this is actually the Sosenatos mine in Sardinia, which I visited year before last, I think. Oh, goodness. Year before last. We would like to drill um, or build a, a lab of approximately 30 by 40 by 30 meter size. Let's see if that's doable and financeable at 200 meters depth in the Lusatia granite build a kilometer scale 3D seismometer array around it in order to do distributed acoustic sensing and to be able to see when gravitational, um, not gravitational, but seismic um, signals come in. And um, then be able to do in this in situ um, setup, meteorological validation of these um, advanced seismic isolation concepts that I showed you earlier with many pendulum stages potentially nested. The controls of that is incredibly complicated and it would be very valuable for the community to be able to do a meteorological validation of that in situ. And of course, that would be a site, this low seismic lab, to do nuclear astrophysics. So um, as I said, I'm very excited to learn more about this. And this is my scared face in, in the mine. So um, with that, I would like to hopefully end just about in time and show you some of the people in my group. We're missing currently three PhD students, I should have updated. Uh, my master's student, our collaboration partners, and uh, our independent group leader who joined our group uh, last June. Uh, and this uh, member of the group uh, has currently retired because he's become too old. So our lab dog, not a lab dog, he never get, went into the lab, he's too hairy. Um, our office dog has retired. So with that, I would like to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll do my very best to answer them. Thank you for your attention.